going to take over predominantly the work that Paul had been doing. Timothy at this current stage, he's the kind of the lead teacher, lead pastor at the church of Ephesus, working alongside with the apostle John, as well as many other good elders in that church. And Paul's given Timothy some good instructions about how he should lead, particularly considering the fact that he's a younger man leading a large, thriving congregation. And so he is teaching Timothy about how to avoid becoming a false teacher like so many other false teachers who claim to be teachers of Christianity. And some of them, even at this stage of the early church, are teaching that godliness is a means to get wealthy. A lot of people are teaching that even today. That if you obey God and you obey the commands of God and you live a godly life, then you'll have a nice car and a nice house and a great bank account and that there's prosperity in the gospel in this life. And that if you live the life that God wants you to live, you will enjoy the blessings of this life that God will give you. That's what some people are teaching and Paul condemns that in verse number five. But in verse number six, he picks up and he says, now godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, I want you to leave here this morning with great gain, but not the gain of wealth and not the gain of many other things that people seek in this life. The gain of peace with God, the riches of heaven and eternal wealth And I want to spend some time looking at this passage because Paul dives into it as he gives this wonderful wisdom from heaven to this young pastor, Timothy. Now, just so you know, this is to pastors, but it applies to all of us. All of us can glean from this wisdom, from this knowledge, and apply it to our lives even before we leave here today. And like I said, you you probably haven't heard a sermon on this before, and you ought to because many, many years ago, There used to be a lot of teaching on this, particularly right after the Reformation. It became aware by a lot of people that this was a big problem, particularly in the Catholic Church, where there was a greed, there was a a discontent nature within that was systemic in the Catholic Church. And so Puritans like Thomas Watson once wrote, Satan loves to fish in the troubled waters of a discontented heart. Another contemporary of Watson was Matthew Henry. And he said, nature is content with little, grace with less, but lust with nothing. If the whole world were monopolized, greed would thirst for more. That's who we are. That's the very nature and essence of what it is to be human. We are discontent with virtually everything. And Paul addresses that in this passage. Now, let's look at that verse again, verse number six, and let's break down some things. Now, he says, now godliness. What is godliness? Now, a lot of people just assume that godliness means godly acts or godly deeds or godly living. But that's not what the word, the Greek word godliness means. It always means virtually the same thing. It's piety towards God. It's reverence. It's respect. So every time the Apostle Paul uses this word godliness, that's what he's referring to, piety towards God or reverence towards God. He says, now, reverence, respect, piety towards God with or accompanied by contentment is great gain. Not money, not power, not prestige, not material wealth. It is Godliness, reverence towards God, and contentment together brings great gain to life. Now, contentment, that word there in the Greek, it's a perfect condition of life in which no aid or support is needed. That's that's the idea. It's sufficiency of the necessities of life. It is a mind content with its lot. It's, It's a state of peace is what that word means. Now, if you are at peace with God and you have reverence and piety towards God or a love of God, we'll use that word, a love of God, you have a love of God and you have a peace that comes because of your love of God, you have the greatest amount of gain that a person could possibly achieve in life. Now, let me give you my interpretation of that verse. My definition of verse number six goes like this. Spiritual wealth is being at peace with the care of your sovereign God 
irregardless of your material status. Let me say that again. Spiritual wealth is being at peace with the care of your sovereign God, irregardless of your material status. And that's the gain that Paul is talking about in this passage. Now, Paul puts it another way in Philippians chapter 4, verse number 11. I'm just going to go ahead and read it. It says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Verse number 19, he says, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Jesus Christ. Now, what Paul's saying in that passage is that he has learned to be content. Catch that. You weren't born content. You were born discontent. You were born dissatisfied. That's why babies cry a lot. That's why they whine. That's why when they're at the grocery store, you see them having a tincture tantrum in the, in the aisle. You see them kicking and screaming. You see them, that's, you were born just like that. And by the way, you haven't changed. You haven't changed. You may, you may think that you've changed. It just looks a little bit, it's packaged differently. But you haven't changed. That is still who you are. You are still very discontent and unhappy with the life that you have. And Paul says, in order to move past that, he had to learn to be content. And you have to learn to be content as well. And I have to learn to be content. You'll never be thankful this Thanksgiving until you learn to be content. Until you remove the, the, the unsatiable desire within you to be discontent with everything. And so if you're going to learn to be content, You need to learn some things about discontentment. I want to give you five truths about discontentment from 1 Timothy chapter 6 this morning. Five truths about discontentment. Number one, discontentment is short-sighted. Discontentment is short-sighted. Look at verse number 7 of 1 Timothy 6. He says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. At the heart of what Paul is getting to here is this. When you are not content and you're living in discontentment, it's only because you're focusing on the here and now. You're focusing on this world. You're, You're only looking at this life. You're not thinking ahead. Your perspective is not, the priorities are not correct. You're not looking in the reality that your life is eternal. You're only focusing on the temporal. So Paul says, For we brought nothing into this world. You began with nothing. You were naked and crying. You had your mother's blood on you. That's that's it. That is all you had when you came into this world. You entered into this reality with nothing. Absolutely nothing. And when you die, you will leave with nothing. You'll take nothing out of this world. We get so enamored with houses and cars and careers and all of the possessions of life, the hobbies and things. You don't take any of them with you. It is certain, he said, it is certain we can carry nothing out. Every pastor since the beginning of pastorhood, I I suppose, have been saying this. There are no hearses, uh, there are no U-Hauls attached to hearses. You've heard that thousand times, right? Maybe it's just me in the South growing up. I don't know, but that, it's a common saying. There are no U-Hauls attached to hearses. You can't carry nothing out. You will leave this world empty-handed. So why be discontent? Why covet? Why be dissatisfied with the stuff that you don't have in this world? None of it is eternal. And if that is how you view your life, you are viewing your life so short-sightedly. Look beyond the days of this world and look into eternity to the things that last forever. Look at verse number 17 in the same chapter. Paul says, command those who are rich in this present age. He's emphasizing that. Those who are rich in this age, not to be haughty or proud, nor to trust in uncertain riches, 
but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Uncertain riches are the things that Jesus talks about later, and I'll look at that passage in a minute, but it's, it's the things of this world. It's the stuff that can be robbed from us. It's the stuff that can be taken away or rust can destroy. It is the stuff that is not eternal in nature. He says, these are uncertain riches. You don't know if your 401k is going to last. You don't know if your retirement plan is going to last. You don't know if your house is going to burn down or stay intact. You don't know. The, the future is totally uncertain to you. So do not be so entangled with this life, the things, the stuff of this life. He says, but to trust God. Put your trust in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. They're temporary possessions. They are temporary things that we are stewards of. Now he goes on to say in verse number 19, storing up for yourselves a good foundation. The word foundation in the Greek kind of means the, the idea of a fund. Storing up for yourselves a good fund for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. The idea is this. Instead of spending all of your days laying hold of earthly things, cars and houses and clothes and guns and I don't know, whatever, the stuff that you are, the things that you, you love. Instead of laying hold of those things that are here today and gone tomorrow, lay hold of eternal things. Grab a hold, cling on to eternal things. Pursue eternal things. Pursue the things that can give you wealth and happiness and peace and joy and fulfillment in this life and in the life to come. Now, I want you to look at this passage. Go to Matthew chapter number six, because Paul is referring to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter number six. Look at it. Matthew six, verse number 19. Jesus says this, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Wow, you say Jesus is a, a killjoy. Jesus doesn't want me to have a bass boat. Jesus doesn't want me to have a camper. Jesus doesn't want me to have jewelry. Jesus doesn't want me to have any fun. Jesus, Jesus wants to ruin. Don't lay up any treasures on this. Jesus doesn't want any enjoyment in my life. But the verse didn't end there, did it? Jesus says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. That's a command. Lay up treasures is a command. Get filthy rich, he says. That's a command. Pursue wealth. Pursue treasure. Get it. Gain it. What kind of treasure? He says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Well, what kind of treasures can you take to heaven? It's not silver and gold. It's not your bank account. It's none of your earthly possessions. It's the spiritual things of this life. It's the souls that we reach out to. It's the love of God that we spread to others. It's the impact that we make on those around us. It's the peace and the joy that we spread to each other. Those are treasures, by the way. Those are wonderful treasures. Lay those treasures up in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. What does he mean by that? If your treasure is on earth, it's material things, then it's, it's, it's a vapor. It's here today, it's gone tomorrow. It's, gonna, it's not gonna last. Thieves can take it away. Rust can destroy it. It can... Be here, it can be gone. He, he mentions moths eating. The moth, I don't know if you, that's kind of an old thing there, but it used to be a time when moths would get in and they would eat the, the clothing. I don't know how, how many of you have ever had that happen before. It's been a long, long time since I've seen that. But the, the idea is that nothing lasts forever. Nothing that is temporal, nothing that is material, nothing that is earthly. Do, do you see the heart of God in this? God's like, I want you to be rich. I want you to be wealthy. I want you to be fulfilled. I want you to be happy. I want you to enjoy great things. So, don't focus on anything earthly. 
because they're temporal. They're just for this life. I want you to be happy in this life and in the life to come. I want you to enjoy the wealth that you can enjoy in this life, and I want you to enjoy that same wealth in the life to come. So pursue spiritual things. So number one, discontentment is short-sighted. If you find yourself constantly discontent about the stuff and the things going on in your life, it's probably because you're not thinking about the afterlife. It's probably because you're not thinking about heaven. You're not talking about, you're not thinking about your eternal state. You're only thinking about the here and the now. So discontentment is short-sighted. Number two, discontentment ignores the current riches that you already have. Discontentment ignores current riches. Look at verse number eight. In having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. Now you say, come on, pastor. Food and clothing is not riches. Well, that's only from your perspective. Let me remind you, you are a sinner. You have already rebelled against God, and it is only the grace of God that you're even breathing right now. It is only the grace of God that he hasn't plucked you from this world and cast you into the pit of hell. It is only the grace of God that, like the sons of Korah in the Old Testament, that he hasn't opened up the ground and let you fall into the pit of hell. That is the grace of God. The grace of God is letting you wear the clothing that you're wearing right now. The grace of God let you have breakfast this morning. The grace of God is letting you continue to exist in your fallen state. You still sin against God. It's not like you've sinned once. You perpetually sin against God, and God perpetually forgives you. God perpetually shows grace to you. God perpetually shows his love to you. You do not deserve anything from God, and God most certainly does not owe you a thing. God owes you nothing. And so if God has given you food today, thank him for that. And if God is allowing you, everybody's dressed this morning. No naked people here. (laughs) So thank God for that. I'm thankful for that. It's cold outside, so thankful for that. God has clothed you. And Paul says here, and having food and clothing, which is the essentials to life. It's the bare essentials. Having the bare essentials to life, these we should be content. Everything else beyond that is wealth. Do you know that statistically in this room, if you're sitting in this room, you are 90% more wealthy than anyone else in the world right now. If you're, sit- if you're an American sitting in this room, you have 90% more wealth than the rest of the people living in the world today. But that's not even how God judges wealth. He judges it as, I've let you live, I've given you breath, I've given you food, and I've given you clothing. Anything on top of that is the mercy of God. Someone once said that, The richest person on earth is the one who does not need anything else. I want to be that kind of a person. The Greek philosopher Epicurus, when asked this question, what is the secret to contentment? His answer was, add not to a man's possessions, but take away from his desires, and he will be content. Think about that. He's not even a Christian. And that aligns perfectly with what the Bible teaches. Add not to man's possessions, but take away from his desires, and he will be content. Sounds awful a lot like what Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 30 and verse number 8. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and still and profane the name of my God. Paul says, I, I don't want to have too much and I don't want to have too little. I just want to be at peace. I want to be content with what God has given me. Solomon's father, many years earlier in Psalm 37 and verse 25 said, I have been young and now am old. 
Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging for bread. I can say the same. I'm not old, but I can say the same. I've, I've been young. I'm still young. I'm, I'm younger. <laughs> Try to stay young. I'm trying to stay as young as I can for as many years as I, as I, my son doesn't think that I'm young, but I think that I'm young. I, I want to keep thinking that way as long as I can. <laughs> Do that. Keep a positive mind. I've been young. I haven't been old yet, but I can tell you the same as King David there. I've never seen God's people begging for bread. God will take care of us. I trust God. I look to the sovereignty of my Lord and my master to take care of me. So number one, discontentment is short-sighted. Discontentment, number two, ignores current riches. Number three, discontentment leads to great sorrow. Discontentment leads to great sorrow. Look at verse number nine. But those who desire to be rich, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. But those who are rich, Oh, no, no, wait a minute. That is what it says. Those who desire to be rich. He didn't say those who are rich. It's not a sin to be rich, by the way. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Samuel, I think it's chapter number six, it says, the Lord hath made, and I'm gonna paraphrase here, Dan Hager's version, some to be poor and some to be rich. God makes us poor or rich, and it's in his prerogative. He, he can look at you and he said, okay, I can trust you with wealth, just like he did with Job. He could trust Job with wealth. Job was the richest man of his time. He could trust Abraham with wealth. Abraham was one of the wealthiest men in the world of his time. He could trust Solomon with wealth. He made Solomon to be the wealthiest man in the history of humanity. And so God makes some to be wealthy. He chooses others to be like myself, poor. And, uh, and maybe you can say that as well. But God trusts us with investments, and God invests his money in different people. And so Paul says here in verse number nine, those who desire to be rich. And what's the idea here? The idea is God didn't make me that rich person, so therefore I want to be that. It's going beyond God's model for your life. It's going beyond God's plan for your life. and says, I desire to be something that I'm not. I desire to have more than I have. I desire more stuff than I've been given. And those who live a life of desire for more, he says, fall into temptation and a snare. A snare is a, an animal trap. Usually it's a little like a, a wire and an animal runs through it and gets stuck in it. And the idea here is that if you're living a life that desires more than what God has given you, you're setting up traps for yourself. You may make it for a while. You may be able to escape some of your own traps for a while, but eventually you're going to fall into your own trap. You're going to fall into your own snare, and it's going to be harmful for you. He says, they fall into a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Now, in the Greek, it's... It, both of those words are very similar. He basically says destruction and destruction. But it's two types of destructions here. One is earthly destruction and the other is eternal destruction. Those who live a life full of lust, those who live a life constantly craving and coveting more, those who live a life who never find contentment in this life set themselves up a trap that they will fall into that will bring hurtful lust into their life. It will drown them so that they cannot get escape from it. All you think about, some of you know what I'm talking about. You've lusted for stuff so much, like, oh, I want the iPhone 12, oh, I want the iPhone 12, or, or whatever. It's like, it's all you can think about. I gotta have this, the new thing. It's like, well, you got an iPhone 11, right? but I want a 12, I want a 12. You know, and, and, you, and you're drowning in it. You can't escape. It's like, it, it's pulling you down. It, it's like, it's all you think about. I have to have this. I must have this. I'm, I'm a, I like to play sports, and there's certain things that, I hate to bring this up, disc golf. <laughs> I play disc golf, I know. Some of you know that, I, I admit it. I need help. I play disc golf. <laughs> Donna, you, 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 back. Norma, you know a little bit about that in your home. People who play disc golf, they need help. They do. It's, it's addictive, and you throw Frisbees, but I'm going to tell you right now, one Frisbee's never enough. 1,000 Frisbees wouldn't be enough. You'd have to, you know, I, there's no end. It's like they all, they different colors. They fly differently. They do different things. I daydream about different Frisbees. I know it's sad. It's pathetic. 
But I think, oh, I gotta have, gotta have these things. It, and and it, it's like it, it, you drown in it. You're drowning in your lust. Silly lust at that. It's, pl- it's plastic, and you throw it at the park. And I'm sitting there thinking, I hope somebody gives me a, a disc golf gift card for Christmas. <laughs> it's, like, you know, it's, like, it's like, that's all I think about. It's, 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 it's harmful lust is what it is. And you drown in these things. And you know what your thing is. It's the stuff that you think about all the time. And when, and when that's the sea that you live in, when that's the ocean that you're swimming in, it's constantly pulling you down and it will drown you. It will consume you. And eventually it will bring destruction to you. He says in verse number 10 of this chapter, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. This lust for money, particularly the false teachers, this lust for money and power and gain and prestige has pierced them through with all kinds of sorrows. And many of you are facing sorrows in your life right now that are unnecessary. You're battling things this moment that you shouldn't even have to be worrying about. King Solomon said this in Ecclesiastes 5, verse 10. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with increase. There's never going to be enough. There'll never be enough. The wealthiest man in the world was once asked, how much more do you need? And he said, just one more dollar. Let me give you some quotes. John D. Rockefeller. Rockefeller was the wealthiest American of all time. He uh, was kind of the guy who set the idea of being a monopoly over industry. Close to his death, Rockefeller said this, I have made many millions, but they have brought me no happiness. The poorest man I know is the man who has nothing but money. Practically where he ended his life. He was the man who had all the money of the world. In fact, the richest man in the world today It's estimated that Rockefeller had three times as much as the richest man today has. Very wealthy man. A contemporary of Rockefeller was Vanderbilt. Cornelius Vanderbilt said this, the care of millions is too great of a load. There is no pleasure in it. Both of these men were monopolizers. The great millionaire John Jacob Astor described himself in these words, I am the most miserable man on earth. Henry Ford, near the end of his life, once remarked, Henry Ford, the founder of the Ford Company, said, I was happier when I was a mechanic. Wealth does not make you happy. Constant pursuing of getting more, doing more. I just listed some Americans who were the wealthiest Americans in our nation's history. And all of them will attest it didn't bring me any happiness. It didn't bring me any fulfillment. In fact, virtually everyone who has ever won the lottery has all said, I wish I didn't because it ruined my life. I wish I never bought that ticket. Discontentment leads to great sorrows. Number four, discontentment is the root of all sin. And I need to move along quickly here. Discontentment is the root of all sin. Look at verse number 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now, there are some linguistic issues in this verse. It's a very difficult verse to interpret. For one, when you read in English, for the love of money, that those three words, the love of money, that's one word in the Greek language. It's only used one time in the entirety of the New Testament, and it's used rarely in secular writings of the same day. It's a very difficult word to understand because of that. The appropriate under interpretation of it most likely is love of money, which goes well with the context of the passage as well. However, depending on what Bible translation that you're reading this morning, when it says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, 
those words kinds of are probably italized in your Bible. Do you see that? The reason they're italized is because they're not in the original manuscripts. That was added by the translators. Because they read this verse and go, okay, I don't see how love can be the root of all sin. I don't see how the, the love of money could be the root of all evil. And so they added those words thinking that that would bring more sense to the verse. But actually it doesn't. The verse reads as it is. The love of money is the root of all evil. Paul didn't make a mistake when he said that. He did not mess up. He wasn't confused when he said this. The love of money is the root of all evil. All evil. Every kind of evil. And you say, that does not make any sense. There's other kinds of sins. There's sins of envy, and there's sins of lust, and there, there's sins of jealousy. You know, you got to be kidding me. The, the love of money cannot be the root of all evil. Well, think of it this way. The love of stuff, the love of stuff, the love of something other than God is the root of all evil. Uh, it's not rocket science. So think of it this way. What is... Uh, what is the one thing that Jesus said was the greatest command that a man could follow? Love your Lord your God with all of your mind, heart, and soul. This is the first and great commandment. He said all other commands hang under that commandment. So we know that is unquestionable by theologians across every denomination that love is the quintessential when it comes to pursuing righteousness, that righteousness is achieved through love. Now, we have failed in that because we don't love all the time as we ought to, and so Christ came to live that out for us. But living the life of love is the means by which living the life of God. And so when he says here, for the love of money is the root of all evil, and I'm thinking, the, the root of all righteousness is love, then logically the opposite of that is the root of all evil. In other words, if loving God is the root to all righteousness, then loving, then loving anything more than God is the root to all unrighteousness. Does that make sense to you? Okay, if, if the love of God is the highest level of righteousness, then the love anything, anything other than God is the lowest point of unrighteousness. He, said, he even mentions it at the end of verse number 10. He calls it greediness, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness. Greediness and discontentment are two sides of the same coin. They cannot exist one without the other. And the point is this, for the love of stuff, for the love of money is the root of all evil. You're not, you may still be questioning, it's like, Yo, how can that be the root of all evil? Well, simply think about evil. Think about the existence of evil. Where did it begin? It began, sadly, as I said, in heaven. It began with the rebellion of Lucifer. Now, just logically follow, follow the train of thought through Scripture. It was discontentment that led Lucifer to rebel against the lordship of God. He was not content with God being God alone. He said five times that he wanted to exalt himself to be as God. He wanted to be like God. He wanted to have the things that God has. He wanted to have the authority that God had. He wanted to have the power and the praise that God had. And so he became discontent with the lordship of God. It was discontentment that led Lucifer to make that choice. Later on, after the temptation of Lucifer to Eve, it was discontentment that led Eve to eat the fruit that was forbidden because she became discontented with the plan of God. In fact, discontentment was the temptation. It was, has God said that you would die? No, 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 no. You don't understand Eve. You see, God's holding back from you. If you eat of this fruit, you'll have all knowledge like God. If you eat of this fruit, you'll be like God. No, 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 God's holding back from you. He, he wants to keep you way down here. He wants to keep you low. You're like his slave. Just eat of this fruit and you'll be like God. It was the temptation of discontentment that led, that literally drove Eve 
to eat of the fruit. It was discontentment that caused Cain to kill his brother. When Cain became very unhappy that God was not pleased with his sacrifice, that God was not pleased with his vegetables. And so God comes in and says, why does your countenance look like it does? Why are you acting like it? And the reason why is because Cain was not happy with how God viewed him and his sacrifice. Cain became discontent with God. He became discontent with the fact that his brother had more pleasure and peace in the eyes of God. It was discontentment that led Abraham and Sarah to question the promises of God and to go about fulfilling the promises of God in their own means. God had told them what he was going to do. He told them how he was going to do it. And after a long period of time, they felt like God can't do it. And so they were discontent in the fact that they're going to be patient and wait on God. Instead, they decided we're going to try to fix it ourselves. It was discontentment that caused the children of Israel to murmur and complain for 40 years in the wilderness. God told them, shoes are going to grow on your feet and your clothes are going to glow on your back and I'm going to send manna from heaven and even the birds from time to time will bring you meat and I I will carry you through the wilderness. There'll be no seas that get in your way. There'll be no struggles that I won't take care of. There'll be no armies that I won't defeat. But in those 40 years, they grew discontent and trusting in God, thinking we were better off in Egypt. The root of their murmuring, the the root of their sin, the root of their rebellion was always because of their discontentment with the promises of God. It was discontentment that led the nation of Israel to reject God as their king. We want to be like the other nations. They all have kings. Why is it God has to be our king? Why is it we have to worship a God we can't see? He's, he's, uh, we don't know where he's at. We, we, want, we want a king like all the other nations. They become discontent with God being their ruler, God being their king. And that led to their idolatrous decisions. It was discontentment that drove King David to lust for another man's wife, as if he needed another woman. He was unsatisfied with what God had given him. He was unsatisfied with where God had put him in life and discontentment drove him down a path of lust. We could go on and on throughout the entire Bible. In fact, you could look at every story in all of the Bible and the root of every problem in every story is discontentment. And you can look at your own life. The cause of every bad, wicked, evil decision you've ever made, it was made off of the premise that you became discontent. Most of all, you became discontent with God. God is your provider. God is your Lord. God is your master. And when you begin to deny him his lordship, you seek to lord yourself. When you deny what your Lord has given you and you become dissatisfied with what your master has given you, you seek to provide for yourself when you're dissatisfied with your God. So discontentment is the root of all sin. Lastly, very quickly here, discontentment can be defeated. That's a positive one. Discontentment can be defeated. Look at verse number 11. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness. So flee the lust, flee the coveting, flee the greediness, flee the discontentment, and embrace, pursue, pursue righteousness. Now look at the list here. Godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Now, what does he mean, lay hold on eternal life? It's, it's the same thing as, as previously there. It's don't lay hold on earthly things. Think about eternal things. If you want to find contentment in God, then long for the things where God is at. Long for the things of heaven. Pursue the things of heaven. Embrace the things of heaven, the things that are eternal. He says in verse number 13, I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate 
that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless, and I had to throw this in. I, I, wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna teach this verse, but I had to because of where we've been for the last 15 weeks. Until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing. It's everywhere in the Bible. It's everywhere. We should be pursuing contentment and godliness and righteousness throughout all of our Christian life until the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, says verse 15, which he will manifest in his own time. I don't know when that'll be. I don't know when he will manifest himself. I don't know when he will come. But I know this, until he comes, I need to flee discontentment and I need to embrace godliness. I need to embrace contentment. I need to embrace righteousness. I want to close with these words from verse 15. In the middle of this teaching, Paul could not restrain himself from worship. As he begins to think about discontentment, and he begins to think about godliness, and he begins to think about being content, it naturally led him into worship, which I hope it will you as well. And in this worship, he says in verse 15, who is the blessed and only potentate, which is the great authority and might, the only potentate, the king of kings and lord of lords who alone has immortality dwelling in unapproachable light whom no man has seen or can see to whom be honor and everlasting power, amen. Here's Paul, he's like, you know what? This is what you need to focus on. Don't be focusing on who you are and what you don't have. Focus on who he is and all that he owns. Focus on that. That's my God I'm talking about. That's the one that loves me. If I have God, I have everything. When Jehovah God is our God, we have no excuses in the universe for being dissatisfied. When God is your God, you have everything. Everything. There is nothing to whine and gripe about. There is nothing to complain about. Our God takes care of us. Our God loves us. Our God is our provider. And so with that, what can we do? What should we do? We should just worship him. We should thank him. We should give our lives to him. We should praise him. He is a great God and he is worthy of all praise. Let's pray. Lord, I pray God that this Thanksgiving season, that we would repent and abandon discontentment, that we would embrace you as our Lord and our God, that we would recognize you for the great provider that you are, the great Lord that you are. God, I pray that this Thanksgiving that we wouldn't just go through the traditions of saying thank you and I'm, and I'm grateful for this and I'm grateful for that, Instead, Lord, I pray that in this moment and every moment for the rest of our Christian life, we would be at peace with you. We would find you to be all sufficient and kind to us and good, our provider, our Lord, our King, our Sovereign. And in recognizing who you are, I pray, Lord, that we would recognize ourselves and see how needy we are of you and find in you all of our joy, all of our happiness, all of our peace. So I pray, God, over this congregation this morning, do a spiritual work, Lord, that will totally transform them from the inside out. Lord, we find our joy in you. We find our purpose in life in you. We give our praise to you. You alone are a great God, and you alone are worthy to be praised. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.